So, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our last class. And um, maybe people are still coming. Uh, it's a good time often to take questions. If you have any questions about what we've done so far these last weeks, about the practice, the instructions, or uh, with uh, your experience meditating at home. So, if anybody has anything, please. Hello. Um, I tend to find my mind drifts a lot when I have my eyes shut. I sometimes find it easier to focus than actually when I uh, keep my eyes open. So I've been trying to sort of do a little bit of both during sessions. Would you uh, say it's good, bad, or...? uh? (laughs) Um, Either is fine. Whatever works best for you. Uh, There are some people who teach this meditation practice where they give the instructions to keep the eyes open or half open, kind of focusing down, looking at nothing in particular. And um, I know for me, sometimes it's worked better to have my eyes open, sometimes closed. Um, So whatever seems to work best for you, it's fine. Chances are that as, uh, as, as a person gets more concentrated or still, that um, it works a little better to be able, if you reduce that sense in, sensory input that comes through the eyes. Uh, you can get quite concentrated with the eyes open, but um, generally, it tend, it, it, the more and more concentrated you get, it's more like more natural to close your eyes and get more absorbed in the focus of concentration. It's like if you're listening to a sound far in the distance, I think that uh, faint sound, it's kind of natural to close your eyes to try to really hear it well. So this uh, practice, uh, <coughs> one thing I, uh, I've noticed is uh, the uh, a gradual development towards an ability to decompose uh, your, your experience at the moment. Namely, uh, say, how, how you're, uh, say, suppose you're having an emotion arise. Uh, you tend to see your, uh, say, forehead tighten, uh, your breath sort of becoming shallow. So you're able to sort of decompose uh, into a couple of uh, discrete items. Right. Uh, now, um, at, at one point, however, uh, uh, it draws a blank in the sense um, uh, certain thoughts arise and some emotions arise and uh, uh, there's a sort of a contraction and I'm unable to sort of see it open as to uh, the thought is causing the, uh, res- uh, the, res- uh, the resistance. Uh-huh. And therefore, the emotion of the other way around the what is sort of at one point becomes the black box. Okay. okay. So, uh, is there a way to split that open? There might be, but it's a very important when you do this meditation practice to not have an expectation of what you're supposed to be able to do. What, what you're asked to do in this meditation is just to be present for how things are and be carefully present. And if you're carefully present, um, if things are made up of different elements, it'll be, it'll be revealed, it'll show itself to you. If that doesn't happen, it's not your job to break it apart. It's your job just to be present for how it is actually is for you. So if you don't, if you're not seeing the difference, I would just be content with that and just uh, just be present for that. Does that make sense? Yes, but then uh, if the um, next step after observing, the observation is for some eventual use, right? Which is to understand why that's happening to you. Right. So if you can't break it open. Uh, are you sort of stranded in your development point? Not necessarily. There's two things that we're trying... In, in a very general sense, there's two things we're developing in mindfulness. One is uh, the ability to see clearly what's there. And the other is uh, the ability to be... Um, uh, to see without being entangled with what we look at. To be free of what we look at. So, um, I could look at the striker and look at it really carefully and see it's made up of wood and leather and different things and, and really see what it is. And that's important to see what it is. Uh, then I can strike properly, you know, as, you know, if I see what it is. But um, maybe I can't see. Maybe I've never seen such an instrument before. I don't have no clue what it is. And so I just see it for what it is. But as I look at it and mindful of it, what's also happening is I'm strengthening my mindfulness. My ability to be present and connect and be with something is being strengthened. And that's also a very important quali- aspect of mindfulness is to strengthen that capacity to be present. And as that capacity becomes stronger and stronger, then uh, you'll have a very different relationship with your life and yourself and the experiences you have. 
you learn how to be present without being entangled or caught or stressed by things. So, um, some, sometimes when we're being present, uh, the, uh, the emphasis is on seeing what's here. Other times what's uh, happening when we're present is we're strengthening this muscle of mindfulness. So when you can't, when, when the thing that you reported that you can't separate apart, I wouldn't, try, I wouldn't make much effort uh, to try to work at separating it. I would just focus on the second part of mindfulness, which is uh, cultivating a stronger sense of presence and present for what it is. So how does that ability then uh, fit in the big picture of eventually understanding why something is happening to you? Yes. Um, and therefore, um, sort of um, getting free of that. Well, so sometimes you get free by understanding why. Sometimes you'll never understand why, but you're free anyway. Without being entangled, right. You might never understand. So it's possible to get angry. And it's helpful to understand the causes of the anger. It's also possible to feel the anger bubble up and have such strong mind blocks and presence that you can, you can see it that there but there's no tendency of the mind or you to get involved with the anger. And so you actually feel quite free. I've had anger bubble up, and up, up, up inside of me and my mind, you know, this is the, the image that came to my mind at the time was my mind, I had a Teflon mind. You know, the, the, it just bubbled up, it didn't stick anywhere. I was completely, my, mind, my mindfulness was so strong and equanimous that the, the, the thoughts of anger bubbled up and I didn't, have to, I didn't have to understand why they were there, what they came from. I was free. From that. So, but other times I've been angry and I had to really, sometimes I like to go for walks when I'm angry, go for long walks, just let the anger be there and just be present, feel it in my body. And then eventually, um, usually for me, I'll, find, I'll discover if I'm with it long enough, uh, I'll discover the anger is really a, um, uh, arising out of either uh, feeling afraid or feeling hurt. And if I could see the hurt or the fear, then it's a whole different analysis, a whole different way of relating to it. And, uh, and so sometimes that happens. So sometimes we can understand what's really going on in a deeper way. And sometimes what's happening is that we're just developing greater sense of presence, ability to be present. And there's a lot of uh, circumstance, circumstance, circumstances in life where um, uh, fixing it or understanding it uh, is not really possible or helpful. What's really helpful with a friend who's in trouble uh, is to really be present. Your friend really feels you're there for the person. Um, and um, I'm involved with uh, training people who do um, become uh, hospital chaplains. And they go around and offer spiritual care to people in hospitals. And one of the biggest um, uh, challenges people have in those circumstances is how not to go into a hospital bed and try to fix the patient. And, and uh, because it's much more profound to be present. And so it's a, and a lot more happens, unfolds, unravels if a person feels like someone's really present for them. So um, the mindfulness practice is more about this presence than it is about understanding. Though understanding comes from presence. So I, I prefer to think of that the understanding that comes from this practice is secondary to presence. And it sounds like perhaps for you that understanding is primary. So, so, so it might be interesting for you to switch, switch them around and let the understanding come, come more naturally rather than trying to understand. And uh, last week, uh, you had talked about, uh, I mean, you had asked me to sort of uh, see the quality of the mind uh, while approaching, uh, while noticing the breath because I, I said that I feel very strained. So um, I guess, I mean, so again there, my observation was that uh, uh, at some point, maybe, as, as I started liking what was happening to me, and I just wanted that not to go away. So I sort of was uh, reaching, as in, you know, to, to the breath as opposed to what you were saying, as in, just wait and let it hit you. Right. I was trying to reach for it. And so, so noticing that again, I, I sort of backed off. Beautiful. So then you can stay more relaxed. Yeah. Beautiful. That's perfect. Congratulations. So thank you. So that's a good segue into what I want to say first this evening. For some people, the instructions I've given here over these last five weeks uh, it can seem like a lot, a lot to keep track of, and a lot of doing. And it can seem as if the instructions are prescriptive, that I'm prescribing what you're supposed to do and to keep track of all these things on my body, my breath, my feelings, my thoughts, my attitude now, and give me a break, all this stuff. 
and that's all it's doing. But um, the uh, instructions are meant not so much as a doing, as, a prescri- as prescriptive, they're meant more descriptive. Meaning that if you're present, these are the areas of your life you'll tend to notice if you're really present. Uh, it's not that you have to go out to understand it, it's more that like you have to be more open and be really here, and then you'll notice your breath, your body, your feelings, your thoughts, and hopefully your attitude as well, your, the mind. Now, the, uh, uh, the description, a classic Buddhist description for um, a human being, or a description, a metaphor, I guess, that's sometimes in, in, uh, depicted in the paintings, um, and the metaphor whatever, for a human being is a one-room house. And um, the one-room house has four windows and a door. And meaning the, uh, uh, in Buddhism, there's six sense doors. There is the uh, five, five sense doors we have in the West. And then the Buddhism posits a sixth sense door, which is the, the, the sense organ or sense door that perceives what goes on in our minds, our thoughts and things in there. So there's six. And, um, and so this, this, this house has these five windows and a door. Now, imagine that in the middle of this house, there's an easy chair. And you're sitting there. And you're sitting there quite relaxed, at ease. Nothing to do, nothing to get, nothing to be. Just sitting there. It's day off. And, um, and the windows are open, the doors are open. And coming in front of the door comes a cat, a stray cat. Peeks, peeks its head through the door and goes away. Come from one of the windows and a bird lands on the windowsill, looks at you and flies away. A squirrel runs across another door and you see the deer out in the yard or something. And so um, the various animals come and go. The neighbors walk by, always come and go. Now you could stay in your easy chair and just watch what comes to the door. Or you could get up and follow something out into the yard. Or you could get up and peer out the door. What's out there? That's, that's, you know, or you can get involved in what's out there. But the instructions in meditation is just to stay in your easy chair and let things simply appear at whatever door or window they appear in. And let them be there. Notice them when they're there. And when they go away, let them go. And um, so the, the, the emphasis here is on being at ease. Being easy. Being at ease. Not trying to accomplish anything. Not trying to force your meditation to become anything. But staying at ease and allowing things to just occur in an easy way. Things, all kinds of things will happen. There'll be a sound outside. Let the sound come to you. You don't have to go to it. An itch will occur. Let the itch arise. You don't have to do anything about it. Just let it be there. Be present for it. See it when it's there. A thought arises, and that's coming through the thought window. So just be aware of the thought. Um, a sensation in your body arises. Be there for that. But the trick is to try to stay in your easy chair. Now, some people can't stay there. They're so restless or so eager to fix things or do things or accomplish things that they'll get up and get engaged. Some people uh, have other strategies. Some people just turn the chair around and face the wall. Don't want to deal with anything, even what comes from the door. The idea is just to stay present. And when something's at the door or window, to really be present for it. Take it in, allow it to be there. Be really offer, offer your presence to it. But when it goes away, let it go away. Make sense? So for me, it's a very nice analogy. Um, now, it's not that analogy of sitting in an easy chair doesn't work so well if the mind is really um, scattered, if the mind is uh, wandering off in thoughts all the time. And so you need to have some kind of stability in order to stay in that easy chair. And that's why we use the breath as the foundation of meditation practice. One of the functions of the breath is to create the stability, help the mind calm down, help the mind not be so scattered, running around after all these thoughts. And it can take a while for the mind to calm down. But once the mind has calmed down, then you take the, you're going to metaphorically take the easy chair and just allow things to arise and pass as they wish. And so in our tradition, we call this choiceless awareness, where you don't choose what arises, you don't choose what you pay attention to. But once you're here, present, you allow choicelessly whatever wants to arise to be there. You're not in conflict with anything. You're not trying to manipulate anything or hold on to anything, just letting things be. And in that radical letting things be, you let yourself be, which many people don't have much experience of, letting themselves just be. We're always trying to fix ourselves or improve ourselves or defend ourselves or whatever. 
just be. And then the meditation practice unfolds, deepens with that sense of beingness. That make sense? Sense enough? So let's try it. So we're going to take a meditative posture. <clears throat> and um, it's just a metaphor that you sit, lean back in an easy chair. <laughs> You're supposed to actually take a good alert posture for this. And part of the reason for that is in the long term, you can actually get more relaxed in your body if you have a upright posture than you can be if you lean against the easy chair. Counterintuitive, if it's the case. So being a little bit careful with your posture, with letting your attention um, notice your spine and letting your spine be a little bit straighter more alert or upright than maybe you normally would have it. Some people find it helpful to kind of wiggle or rock back and forth a little bit when you first sit down to help settle into your body, feel connected to your body. And because after a busy day, people's minds are often scattered, preoccupied. There's a number of things we can do to help us arrive here and now more fully. And one of those things is to take a few long, slow, deep breaths. Using the big in-breaths as a way of connecting to yourself, connecting to yourself physically. And as you exhale more fully, relax, let go. As you exhale, settle in to your body, settle into your seat or your chair. And one of the things we're trying to do is to have our mind and body be at the same place at the same time. And if you're thinking about earlier today or what's happening tomorrow or in some fantasy land, then your mind, we say, is elsewhere. It's not here. Not here where the body is. And you can't bring your body to the past or the future and that what we can do is bring the, bo- the mind here into the body. So they're coordinated to working together. Mind and body in the same place at the same time. And then letting yourself breathe normally. It can be helpful to scan through your body to see if there's any obvious places that you can soften or relax. Some people can soften their belly. So the belly hangs forward. Some people find it helpful to soften around the shoulders and the shoulder blades. Or if there's any holding in the area of your heart, maybe you can soften around that. And some people carry tension in their jaws or their face, eyes, forehead. Relax it if you can. If you can't relax it, maybe you can soften around it. So, keeping your spine upright. See if from the inside you can set yourself at ease. It's 
set yourself at ease in your body. Or at least be easy, ease up from any discomfort there is in the body. Let yourself be at ease in your mind. Or if you're uneasy in some way, try to ease up, hold it lightly, the discomforts of your mind. And then connect to your breathing. Notice how your body experiences breathing. And see if you can hang in there, tracking one breath after the other allowing the breathing to help settle you, quiet you, bring you into the present. When the mind wanders off in thought, gently bring it back to the breathing. Begin again with mindfulness of breathing. like a small flat rock that slowly sinks into the water to the bottom of the lake. Let yourself ride or watch the breathing as if it's a little rock that's letting you settle. into the floor of your being, here and now. Being with your breathing, offering your breathing the kind of presence that you would give a, to a good friend or when you're listening to someone carefully. Be really present.
Continue to stay with your breathing. And when some other experience becomes compelling, arises strongly, see if you can stay in your easy chair. Allow it to arise at the door or the window. Let it be there, be present for it. However long it wants to stay, be present. And when it goes away, let it go. Sound of traffic arises. If it's strong, if it comes into your awareness, note it, be aware of it. Let it go. Sensations of your body, feelings and emotions. Certain thoughts might arise and become obvious in awareness. Stay in your easy chair. Don't get involved in the thoughts. Just know that they're there. Let go of them if it's easy. See if you can stay at ease with whatever is going on. Being aware, being present for what is.
when you find yourself drifting in thought, notice how different it feels to have been drifting in thought compared to knowing it clearly, being present for that. Whenever you can, keep, com- keep coming back to presence, to awareness of what is. In the middle of it all, breathing in mindfully, breathing out mindfully.
Notice how you are, the quality of your mind. And see if you can notice a difference between letting the mind be whatever way it is, your attitude to be whatever way it happens to be, without awareness, versus really being present and knowing this is how it is. Being mindful. So the suggestion is that our life unfolds a lot better, certainly a lot less stress, but also a lot more sense of freedom and wisdom if we start being present for our life in a careful way. So to be present for, uh, and that's what meditation is trying to help us do, is to be really present rather than the mind carrying us away in all kinds of ways. To be really present for our breath, for breathing. Breathing has a very profound spiritual aspect to it. The more we can get connected to our breathing. And um, to be present for our body, to be in our body, connected to our body. To be uh, connected or present for our emotional life. Connected but not entangled. To be present for it. To be present for our cognitive life, the thinking we have. Not entangled with it, but but present, present but not engaged. Or and then um, so breath, body, emotions, thoughts, just the nature of the mind, state of the mind. And um, so that's kind of what we've kind of covered these first five weeks of the course. And um, the question is how to go further with this. Is it more than just being present? And there's two primary ways to go further after you have the basic idea of what the practice is. And that is um, um, 
to practice it in daily life and to develop more concentration or stability together with the mindfulness. So, in daily life. The um, metaphor or analogy of the easy chair works a little bit, but it also uh, fails in that it suggests that, there's, that mindfulness, someone practicing mindfulness is kind of passive. Just sits there in an easy chair and just let life happen. Um, and uh, you're not going to you know, sit in an easy chair as you go about your life. Mindfulness is, is about being easy, being open, being present for what's here, not being caught, not being stressed by things, just being present. But also, but it's not withdrawal. It's actually allowing us to connect more fully with our life, to be present for our life. And I like the, the word contact or connectedness. That we're connected, like when you bring my two hands together, they're connected, but they're not entangled, not tied up with each other. When I place my fingers together, they're just they're connected. They're con- contact. I can have my hands apart and I don't feel the contact. So the, the presence of mindfulness has a quality of, some kind of quality of being really present, almost like you're making contact with whatever experience is. Even if you're present listening to someone else talk, you know, you're not necessarily touching them physically, but you're there in some way that's, that's tactful or, or, or uh, full or really there, present for that. The mind's not wandering off into other thoughts and planning what you're going to say next or you're caught up in judging them or something. Just you're there, fully there, present. So um, life tends to unfold a lot less stressful, much more with much greater ease when we can be present for our life as we go about it. And so a big part of deepening this mindfulness meditation practice is to begin applying or doing the practice in daily life as well, not limiting it to meditation. And in fact, we say that the line between the mind when it meditates and the mind when it's out and about in its life is an arbitrary line. There's no real difference. It's the same mind. So as we start discovering a higher quality of mind through meditation, then uh, it becomes natural to want to kind of that, that higher quality of mind or relaxed mind be present in daily life as well. So then to bring, uh, bring that same mindfulness practice in daily life. So to be present for our life, to pay attention to what's going on here and now. And um, now there's a variety of ways this can be done. But uh, to give you a little uh, example of what, how this can be done in a little practical way, some people have found it very helpful to, um, um, for example, to put stickers on different places in their house, like on the phone or on the light switches or, you know, in the drawers or the door handles or different places. And when they're about to uh, use or see those, those stickers, those dots, they oh, pay attention. What's going on right now? Or some people, when the phone ra- rings, they ch- some people's attitude towards the phone ringing is it's important to answer the phone as quickly as possible. The fewer rings, the better. I don't know why, but um, uh, but the mindful approach would be let it ring for a few times. People aren't going to hang up after you know just three or four rings. Uh, let it ring and take the two or three rings to be present. Check in with yourself. How are you right then? What's happening here and now? How are you feeling? What's your concerns? Because then you have a better sense of who you are when you have to enter the conversation with someone on the phone. You'll be more connected to yourself and thereby probably more connected to them. Find out what's going on. For a long time, I used door frames as my mindfulness cue, reminder. So whenever I walked through a door frame, I was walking into a new space. So I use a door frame, oh, what's happening? Sometimes I pay attention to what was happening with me and I'd be surprised. Oh, I didn't know I was rushing. I didn't know I was feeling that way. I didn't know I was not paying attention. And sometimes I'd pay attention to the room I was walking into. What's happening here? What's going on? So some people use different things as a cue, as a reminder. Bring yourself into the present moment and notice what's happening here. Another thing that people have used when they're driving a lot, they've used uh, traffic lights. You know, you're waiting for the light to turn green, right? So, you know, Nothing has to happen unless I guess the audience people are on the phone, so there's important things happening. But um, but if you're not on the phone, then um, be present. What's going on? How are you feeling? What's happening? Notice. Practice noticing. Practice mindfulness here and then. You don't have to get deeply calm, but you can just notice. And probably what you'll find is if you notice what's happening, you, your life will start getting richer. 
And you'll take more responsibility. You reclaim your life. Take more responsibility for how you want to be in your life. Too many people live their life without taking any response, any healthy responsibility or choice about how they want to be. They're just kind of rushing and doing and this and that and letting their mind kind of drive the show. And But if you stop and pay attention, you have a chance to make some choices. So you're driving your car, you stop at the red light, and you find yourself really impatient for that light to turn green. Is that how you want to live your life? So you can ask yourself, so by being present, you can maybe ask yourself that question. If the answer is yes, then go be impatient. But not near me when you drive. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, if, um, but maybe you say, oh, this is not how I want to live my life. Does it, you know, what difference does it make? How does it help things if I'm impatient while I'm waiting for the light to turn green? Maybe I can breathe deeply, relax for these few seconds. So as we bring more presence, we have more choice. And we have more choice, we can look and make choices that are wiser, better for how we want to live our lives, how we want to engage in things. Some people like to practice mindfulness uh, in conversation. And there's a lot to be discovered about yourself uh, if you pay attention to how you are in conversation. Uh, one thing to f- discover is maybe, for some people, how little they really listen. And listening sometimes is considered a synonym to mindfulness. The qualities that you needed to really listen well are the same qualities needed to be mindful well. And so you might experiment in conversation with people to switch from being much more in the listening mode, a good listener, as opposed to a good speaker. So notice you interrupt. Do you, you know, is your opinion more important than what you're hearing? What's going on there? A mindfulness in speech can also be looking a little bit, being present, present enough to have some sense occasionally of why you're saying what you're going to say. Why do you say? A lot of people will speak without ever questioning why they're going to say what they say. What I'm going to say it is important. I had dinner today. I'm just making this up. I had dinner today at the, the absolutely best Chinese restaurant. Now, why am I saying that? Why would I say that? I might say because I'm just enthusiastic about the good food, so I kind of, you know, overdoing it by saying the best, exaggerating a little bit. Who knows if it's the best? Or it could be that I want to impress you that how, what a great choice in restaurants I'd made. And by saying I ate the best, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, look at me, I had a, you know, a good time. It's kind of saying something about me, not just about the food. So maybe that's a silly example, but, but why do we say what we want to say? So to be present for yourself and notice what the thoughts are, what the feelings are, gives a lot of information. And sometimes that information when you speak will save you from making a lot of mistakes. It said that it takes years to make a good friend and one sentence to lose the friendship. So you want to be careful of being present and make wiser choices. Some people find it very helpful to extend mindfulness in daily life because it helps keep their life a little calmer, more easeful. And uh, some people choose particular activities to, to bring more mindfulness to. Some people like to drive mindfully. That's really a quality time to be with yourself. They turn off the radio. They turn off the cell phone for sure. And they try, this is a quality time to be present. And it's probably helpful for the other drivers if I'm really present too. And, um, and that's where they cultivate kind of mindfulness. Some people find something as simple as um, if you're driving to work, for example, and you have to walk from the parking lot to the place of work, park a little bit further away perhaps, and use the walk from your car to your office as a place to practice uh, walking meditation, walking mindfulness, being present as opposed to letting the mind have free reign to rush ahead to the day of what needs to happen and all that. Be present. So when you arrive at work, you're more likely to be present for what's happening and therefore make wiser choices rather than getting caught up in it all right away. Some people find it nice to choose different activities for different weeks. They're going to, they're going to focus on practicing mindfulness in daily life, like uh, washing dishes. Okay, whenever I wash dishes this week, I'm going to be present. Nothing, you know, my mind wanders away, wanders away, I come back and be, feel it be there and with the experience of being with the dishes and myself. Or another week it might be uh, cleaning. And so I'll be with cleaning my house. That's what I'm going to really be present here. Some people find it nice to do it when they eat. Some people find it very nice at least once a week to eat alone in silence. Or not, in si- not alone, but in silence. So you can really practice being really present for your eating. It's a whole different world. Um, for some people, there's a lot of um, complicated emotions around eating. 
And uh, if you can really stop and be silent and be present, take your time when we eat, a lot of that can unravel, become clear. It might be um, shopping. It might be you know, all kinds of things you might choose. And if you choose different things over different weeks, then um, for the, after you've done it for a week, it kind of becomes a little bit second nature or becomes a little bit of a habit or a little bit more familiar with that domain. And slowly over the year, doing different activities, your, your daily life becomes richer, more fuller. You have a deeper, deeper connection with all the different things you can do. And then that feeds back to your meditation. If you continue doing a daily meditation practice, the more you practice mindfulness in daily life, the more, I think, stronger your meditation practice will become, the more it supports it. So that's very nice. So that's one whole way to develop the mindfulness practice, apply it to daily life, not just meditation. The other way is to um, develop a st- stronger concentration so that when you're, when you're paying attention, when you're mindful of something, you're not just, you're, you're not just mindful in some simple, you know, I don't know what to say, simple way, or just mindful in some kind of normal way, normal consciousness kind of way, but you're actually, the mind is really still and has a real ability to focus and really kind of be present in some really careful way. Probably you've had, you know the difference between someone who's kind of vaguely present for you, really present for you, and then really, really kind of, you know, connected and there for you, really focused. So sometimes it's, uh, there's some of the depth of what mindfulness can do for you comes when you have this real focus. I'm really here. And... Um, so um, sometimes we say that um, concentration provides the three legs of the tripod for mindfulness. Mindfulness is the telescope that looks. And then um, the concentration is the tripod that gives stability to the telescope so you can see really clearly. If you try to hold a big scale telescope and look at a star, it doesn't work very well. You have to have it on a tripod. And um, so the concentration it provides that stability. So how do we develop more concentration or more stability to go along with the mindfulness? Uh, one way is regularity of practice. It's probably one of the most important things. Just practicing every day, day in, day out. I used to, when I was the first few years I practiced, I didn't, I didn't meditate on Sunday. I didn't, took a day off. You know, <laughs> was to take a day off. So um, that's because when I was introduced to meditation was at San Francisco Zen Center. And uh, they meditated a lot there. But I, no one ever explained to me why, but they didn't meditate on Sunday. So I, thought, I took that as an example. Okay, I won't meditate on Sunday. Now I meditate on Sunday. But, but uh, you know, but to have the regularity, at least, you know, seven, six days a week. Just and um, it's often good to do the same time because the, the mind um, benefits from regularity. It's like a little kid, you know, like a three-year-old or two-year-old. Having a regular schedule really helps the kid. You know, it's more likely to do what you want, doesn't act out. Well, the mind is like a little kid sometimes. And to have that regularity helps the mind, supports the mind. And you say, no, I want to do this and that, this is important. But your mind really, that two-year-old, <laughs> two-year-old mind, really does well with regular regularity. So just do it regularly. Um, another, uh, uh, so that's, just, that's one aspect. There's many things to say about developing more concentration. But the other whole way in which our tradition develops greater concentration with the practice is by doing retreats. And um, we actually are, uh, it's not obvious maybe coming here, but uh, we uh, are uh, really big on retreats. We're we're kind of a retreat culture kind of group, some of us. And um, so uh, going on retreats, and you know, most spiritual traditions have, have, have something like going on retreats, you know, 40 days in the desert, uh, you know, like that, or, or uh, vision quests the Native Americans did going into the wilderness for a while by themselves. And uh, the idea of going on retreat is an ancient thing in Buddhism, spending time where you step out of your life as you normally lived so you can get a better look at things. Um, sometimes if you stay always in the midst of your life, you, do, you, know, you don't see things clearly. That's why some reason why some people go on vacation is to get out of their life and see things anew, just get a new fresh perspective, get fresh air, let things go a little bit. So we go on retreat and uh, spend longer periods of time meditating. And, the, and by, sit, by meditating longer through the day, uh, uh, it allows the mind to settle more and let go of the more everyday concerns that often keep us preoccupied. And as, the, as those preoccupations fall away, it's easy and easier to get concentrated and still and be really present. And it's one of the great delights of life is to have all the preoccupations fall away 
the mind is not inclined to go thinking about the future, the past, other things, the worries, ambitions, desires, all this stuff. And the mind has just finally come to rest. Not in some kind of sleepy way, but luminously clear. It's here and clear. Just It's not going anywhere. It's just like, it's such a, an amazing pleasure. I don't know what, it's, what to compare it to that makes some of you, makes sense to some of you. But what comes to mind is um, uh, you can go around, drive around here in the peninsula for weeks and months and not really notice the air quality. <coughs> and then one day, it's crystal clear the air. And you can see the Mount, Mount Hamilton range across the bay and see it clearly. And, and it's just such a, it's such a delight. It's such a great, so refreshing to have that clarity that suddenly... You didn't realize you, you missed it or you didn't, didn't know what you were you missing. You didn't have it because you just come so used to the kind of the smoggy air. So be really present and not have the mind murky or foggy or distracted is one of the great things of life. So that's more likely to happen. It, ha- it happens slowly over time if you practice every day at home, but it happens quicker and in a deeper way by going on retreat. And so in our tradition, we have a variety of retreats. Here at IMC, for example, the, I guess the shortest retreat we have is what's called the half-day retreat, which we do Wednesday mornings from 9.30 to 12.15. So you, can, you know, that works for some people. And then we have day-long retreats on Saturday, that kind of from about 9 to 4.30. Sometimes they're longer. And, uh, and then we also, in our in IMC, and also in our wider kind of of the Vipassana tradition, uh, we put on residential retreats. And some people will go away for a weekend or for a week or 10 days and sometimes longer, a month, and be on retreat. Um, and, and these meditation retreats that we put on, um, they're done in silence, so there's no talking during the retreat, which for the novices is, is frightening. And now how can I manage that? And why would I want to? Um, and sometimes it's kind of hard at the beginning, but Almost always, after 10 days of silence, most people, novices, who don't want to give it up. No, no, I have to talk. Please, no. <laughs> Whereas they went in kicking and screaming. You know, it's so sweet. But one of the things that sp- speech, um, speech activates a lot of our um, uh, concerns about how we are in relationship to other people, how people see us, how I present myself, what I need to accomplish, a lot of different things. It's very complicated, the whole social world we live in. And by not engaging in speech for a length of time, it allows a lot of the social concerns and obsessions and neuroses to fall away. And so it's easier to settle into some very deeper, quieter, more intimate place with ourselves. So we do these retreats in silence. We also do them... um, 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 We try to do them so there's as minimal extra activity as possible. So there's no, there's a little bit of work you do every day to help the chores of the retreat center, but um, you know there's no television, there's no, you don't read books, you don't journal, you don't, you know, play golf. And, you know, just you're there. This is what you're doing. And um, and some people do a long time, uh, long time retreats. The longest retreat I did like that was eight months, and it was, uh, I would say, qualifies as the best time of my life, among the very best time of my life. It's counterintuitive, right? I, I didn't have a clue what was on television those eight months. You know, so it was a pretty deprived life. <laughs> but it was the best, boy. I was more happy. I had more sustained happiness during that time in my life, probably any other, other time in my life, sustained, kind of just joy and happiness and rapture and delight. And the time went really fast. I couldn't believe how fast it went. And nothing was happening. Mm-hmm. Meditating, meditating, meditating. Um... So I'm not recommending necessarily you to go for a long time like that, but um, but uh, just let you know that the, one of the ways of deepening this practice is to bring it to retreat. And if you're new to all this, you don't want to necessarily do it right away, but you start doing a regular practice, and probably if you do it regularly after a while, you'll feel at some point you'll feel a time, oh yeah, I think I'd like to do more of this, and it feels right, and uh, and then you might consider a retreat. So another reason, um, so we couple the mindfulness with concentration. And concentration allows us to see more deeply. And not just have stillness of mind or greater clarity, but also to see more deeply. And one of the things that helps us see through is it helps us see through the concepts we tend to uh, 
use to interpret the, our life. Much of life is, is seen through concepts, ideas. And um, some of them are innocent enough, appropriate, the ideas of man and woman. But for example, someone might see you through the concept you know, of someone's spouse, if that's the case. And, um, and I know there's a number of spouses who uh, don't want to be seen as the spouse. I'm not a spouse, I'm, I'm me. And so, you know, they don't want to be, you know, they don't, that's not how they want to see as, as for them, their own sake, not as someone's, someone's spouse. And so, they're being, they're, it's very clear they're being seen through a concept. And probably all of you have had the experience of somehow being seen through someone else's concepts. Maybe they hold you pegged you from some past experience. Once, just once, you were a little bit irritated. But that person happened to see that day. And now they always relate to you as the angry one. <laughs> but, but, but... There's all kinds of ways in which people lock ourselves up. And there's a lot of pain in our society because of how people see each other through concepts, ideas, judgments, and all that. And we see ourselves that way, through concepts and judgments. And we have all these opinions about how things, how things should be, as we see things through the opinion of how things should be. So opinions, concepts, stories, the mind is a story-making, opinionating thing. And part of the function of mindfulness is to help us to cut through all the concepts, all the shoulds, all the interpretations, so we can see what's really here. So I want to uh, demonstrate this for you in a way that maybe you'll never forget and always uh, maybe remember in a way that hopefully, remember at the right time to save you a lot of grief. But I need some, uh, some things to demonstrate with. So you have to look at this. This is a leaf. And it's a leaf that's what? About two inches long? So it's just a leaf. It is what it is. And we put a lot of store in Buddhism on just seeing things as they actually are in and of themselves. We call it sometimes the thusness or the suchness of something. So you're seeing this leaf, you can just see the suchness of the leaf. The leaf in and of itself. And perhaps if you're lucky, you're not comparing it to past leaves and this leaves and you know and future leaves or perfect leaves it's just a leaf by itself but then something very interesting can happen when I lift up another leaf and put it next to it and this leaf now in my left hand is what five inches long so the first one was two inches so now I can say something I couldn't say before now I can say that the first leaf is the small leaf and the second leaf is the big leaf. Right? Right? It's pretty clear, right? It's pretty, not, 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 that's not difficult concepts. But now watch the magic. Right? Small, big. Right? Big, small. Now watch. You can even watch the sleight of hand, how it works. <laughs> you know? That's, you, now put this one down. Lift this one up. And, and this one's about an inch long, Right? So now which one is the big one? Which one's the little one? The one that was little before is now the big one. The one that was, right? Isn't that magic? Isn't that amazing? So things like big and small do not reside in things. Things are not inherently big or small. Things are big or small in relationship to what we compare them to, through comparisons. Big and small are concepts that we add to an experience. It's not inherent in the experience itself. And so there's a lot of concepts like this that are not inherent, but are added. Often good and bad are added. And it turns out that a lot of the ways in which human beings tend to suffer around their sense of self, but who they are, belongs to the category of comparison, comparative concepts. I'm not short enough. I'm not tall enough. I lived in Japan for a while and I was too tall. You know, I felt awkward. And then I know people who are short and they feel I'm too short. When I was uh, in, uh, 13, I was, uh, it was 1967. And uh, those of you old enough to remember this, 67 was um, 
anyway, you know, was 67. <laughs> and, um, and I was, that summer I was living in, uh, in uh, Italy, in a small provincial city in Italy. And I'd, li- I'd been living in California. And I had the longest hair of any boy, because that long hair was the thing to do. And I was the only one with blue jeans in the town. I was hip. I was you know, ahead of my times. And I was cool. And I felt a certain kind of good energy about myself. Cool energy. Wow, you know, the only long hair in the town. And then I went back to Los Angeles at the end of the summer. And I missed a lot of what happened in the summer of 67. And when I got back to L.A., my friends in school all had much longer hair than I had. And their blue jeans weren't just blue jeans. They had figured out how to cut them up and sew them up and put them through the washing machine a hundred times and bleach them. And some of them actually put their blue jeans on their road so cars would drive over them. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I just had blue jeans. And so my sense of self diminished. All I did was cross the Atlantic. And now I felt kind of low down. I actually was pulling my hair in school, trying to make it grow faster, and I felt really bad. So my sense of vitality or deflation had to do with who I was comparing myself to. Is my nose too big, too small? Am I, too, am I smart enough? Am I not smart enough? You know, all this stuff. What mindfulness can help us do is to see concepts for what they are and not buy into them if they're not useful, not be caught by them. And, but it really helps if we're concentrated and still and so we really can have a penetrating ability in the mindfulness. And the concentration really helps us to drop below the concept level. It's hard to do that sometimes if you're just doing mindfulness without the proper stillness of mind. So, and it's very freeing to become free of all these concepts, all these comparisons, all these judgments and ideas and shoulds and shouldn'ts is really freeing and it, and it creates a much higher quality of being, a much higher quality of life. And it also gives us a lot more choice about which concepts we choose to live by. Because unless we're mindful, some of these concepts appear to be just, this is the way the universe was built. You know, I'm just a klutz. That's the way the universe was built. Or this is the way things should be. You know, people should always give me the right away. Isn't that how it should be? Or, or whatever. And um, we, have, we have these concepts that just are, we feel are inherent to the universe. But they're not. They're constructions of the mind. And so it's very, very freeing to have the ability to cut through it. And so mindfulness can, uh, coupled with concentration is one of the things that can help with the unfolding in what Buddhism, what Buddhism calls wisdom, the deepening wisdom. Wisdom happens when we can cut through the concepts or see through them and, be, and, uh, and understand the bigger picture of what's going on. Make sense? So, um, um, yes? Uh, I, I'm uh, a bit confused with the concept of uh, cut through versus what I had asked earlier. Yes, of course. You, it makes sense. Yeah. It happens, nat- it happens naturally. You don't have to do it. You don't have to be looking or trying to cut through. If you get still enough, and are present enough for what is, the mind will cut through by itself. So again, it's not uh, essentially analyzing it or uh, decomposing it. Right, right. I mean, I mean there's nothing, nothing wrong with analyzing and nothing wrong with breaking things apart and uh, you know, doing all that. There's nothing wrong with that. But if most people do too much of that and it just keeps their mind agitated and busy and manipulating things. <laughs> And, uh, and generally, for most people, the practice unfolds uh, better if we step out of the fixing mode or trying to make something happen or the digging mode or looking and analyzing mode and just try to be fully present. And as we're present, things will unfold, the natural unfolding of things. It tends to be better for people. And also, one of the interesting things that happens with that is that if you're analyzing or you're trying to fix or cut through, it's, it will subtly, subtly or grossly reinforce the notion that you're in charge, your ego, your small self. And, um, and there's actually something much more profound that can happen when we let go of the usual identity of us in charge. 
And so you actually go deeper into meditation, deeper into the world of wisdom and freedom, when you're not always uh, uh, the, the feel like you're at the controls. And it's all up to you. Make sense? So other questions? No, it is your turn. Do you have questions or comments you'd like to make? Protests? <laughs> because your mind will protest some of these things for sure. What do you mean, let go of shoulds? It's the should is, should be there. <laughs> the analogy of the house. So I'm sitting on the comfort chair and the squirrel shows up. And sometimes um, the squirrel shows up and, and I'm distracted with, with a certain thought. And a few minutes <laughs> pass by <laughs> before I get back to, oh, you know, wow. Here I was again, thinking about something else. So yes. I catch myself. I bring myself back to the breath. I see the squirrel. Um, and, and, but I, I feel bad for the time that I lost because it's 20 minutes and it's just 20 minutes. And now okay. there's you know, 12 minutes left. And okay. So, and, and it's interesting that I've been doing regularly. I've been 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes okay. in the evening for, since January. And I tend to continue this way. But... The meditation has gotten a little more boring, so to say, <laughs> because of that game that I'm playing of, you know, being hard on myself. With. So I'm just wondering if you have some mm-hmm. technique suggestions for how to just... Good. It's a, it's a great question. And um, no moment of mindfulness is ever wasted. It's always good. So if you wandered away for 20 minutes and then you came back for a moment, uh, that moment is great. And so it's better to celebrate that moment than follow that moment with, oh no, you know, I was lost again. Because it's very interesting, the first moment when you notice your mind was been away for 20 minutes, that first moment is usually suffering free, judgment free. But our judgment tends to be so fast. But that first moment is quite pure. And what we like to do is try to kind of extend the purity of that moment, that moment to be longer before we kind of add the judgments and all to it. But what it sounds like to me is that uh, uh, you're treating the squirrel as a squirrel coming through a window, but somehow your mind, what your mind does, is something much more, um, it's somehow outside the scope of the meditation. What I like, so I would say a different way. Um, your mind wandering away is just another squirrel in a different window. You're judging it as being bad. It's just a different kind of squirrel at a different window. All we have is step preparing in windows. So rather than uh, saying that you shouldn't be judging, say, oh, look, look at that squirrel. It has a judgment flavor. <laughs> wow, this is what judgment is like. Okay, I'll be present for judgment. Gil tells me to be present for judgment. Okay, I've never really been present for judgment before. I've always been in this antagonistic relationship with it, or I, or I, or I believed it and ran the show. But I'm being asked to just be present for what it's like to be judgment. I get to study what it's like to be judgmental. Wow. It feels this way in my jaws. It feels this way in my shoulders. It feels my brain it seems contracted now. The speed of my thoughts is going faster. Um, there's this fear that's connected to my judgment. Um, wow. There's a lot of stuff. I didn't know so much was going on. So, you, so the idea is to turn, you, what we do, try to do whenever we can is rather than leading something off the stage, to fester, we invite everything on the stage of mindfulness. Or to say a different way, uh, whatever is bothering us, we turn around and look at that. And my guess is you haven't done that. You're trying to cope with it and deal with it and come back and really be with that one squirrel. <laughs> and not really turning around and looking at the mind that wanders away. To look at the mind that judges. Is this making sense to you? Yeah. Thank you. You think you can do that? Do that turning and inclu- include that as part of the the mindfulness? I, I can, I, yeah, I, I want to try to. I just, um, the, the, the only thing that comes to mind still, the, the, the unanswered, I guess, question is that that voice that catches myself going, oh, I just wandered yeah. off. I forgot to focus on the breath. Yeah. I forgot to be aware of the now, I right. went off to the past or to the future, to a plan or to a memory. Um, sometimes it just, it, it kind of, 
it catches up after six minutes instead of, you know, right away, which is where I'd like to be. Right, right. So it takes time. This is called a practice. So, so, so two things, a variety of things. One is that um, how you are with yourself when you've noticed the mind has drifted off, that's a really profound place of deep practice, important practice. Uh, because the tendency for a lot of people is to all their attitudes and judgments about themselves and how they should be successful and accomplished and all that can come into play there. And so for you to work with that and find a more a compassionate way to be with yourself, a more accepting, more easeful way to be with all that could have uh, implications not only for meditation but even outside of meditation. And so if the, fact, the fact that you had to be gone for, wandered away for 12 minutes it doesn't really matter. It matters when you wake up that you engage that, how you are, what's going on. So when you wake up and all this judgment gets there, I, I really want to repeat that I think it's actually maybe a very significant place for you to bring attention to and just be glad you have the chance. And then um, and if you do that slowly, I think you'll probably find yourself becoming um, more mindful more often, more s- sooner, not drifting, uh, drifting up uh, less and less. Also, um, after you kind of work through the judgment thing and you're more, ease, more at ease, more compassionate about the fact you wandered off, then you can also turn around and look then at what is, the, what, is, what is the mind like that keeps drifting off? And you might find that there's a lot of tension in your mind. And, uh, and you can actually feel it physically sometimes. And, and so rather than just letting go of your thoughts as ideas and come back to the breath, what you need to do is spend a little bit of time softening the tension or the pressure that's almost physical that's there with the thinking brain. Thinking brain is like a muscle, thinking muscle. Because if you stay tense or you stay worried or if you stay angry or upset or something, or if, if anger or upsetness or pressure or tension is the, is the fuel, the, the factory for thinking, you can let go of thoughts forever and, you let, and, the, and the factory just produced more thoughts. So once the judgment is, is uh, judgment and the negative thinking about it all has fallen away enough, then you might have the chance to look and see what's what's going on with this thinking muscle for me, uh, emotionally, physically, tension-wise, and then be present for that. And as you're present for that, you're present, and then it settles. And then with time, it's not going to be such a big big obstacle. Is this making sense? Yes. Sense enough? Yep. Thank you. So so. Um, I'm not saying, what I'm saying is not easy to do. It's, you know, it's really easy to be a teacher. <laughs> you know, I can just, it's easy to say, this is how you do it. It's not so easy to do this practice, in fact. And um, so I'd be delighted to talk to you further about this. If you try, make an effort and, make, you know, engage in this, I'd like to hear how it goes. And if you have further questions, I'd be happy to engage them. They said the cliche is that mindfulness is really easy. What's hard is to remember to do it. <laughs> so someone else. Yes. For me, it's very easy to, to lose concentration, concentration in my exhale. Oh, you, can be, you can be very present for the exhale. No, uh, no the contrary. Ah, you can be present for your inhale, yes. but the exhale, your mind wanders away. Yes. That's a great observation. And uh, most people will have um, um, uh, some phase of breathing is more clear than other phase. And sometimes it's the in-breath which is more clear, sometimes it's the out-breath which is more clear. And if some part of the, uh, of, the, of the phase of breathing is not so clear, that's the more likely place the mind's going to wander off. And that's probably what you'll find if you pay attention. So if you know you have that pattern, if you know you have that pattern, then you want to, um, when you get to the beginning of the out-breath, you want to remember, remind yourself, hang in there, <laughs> hang in there to the end. And then, and then the in-breath comes and you can go with that. So that's helpful. And um, there are a few people occasionally who have trouble with the out-breath because the out-breath um, is a kind of letting go, letting go of control. And some people, it's very difficult to let go of control and to get afraid. And so they don't want to breathe out all the way. So I don't know if something like that is going on for you, but... It's, it's very, uh, uh, um, most people have less awareness of their out-breath. It's less clear than the in-breath. That's the most common pattern. And so knowing that pattern, then you can make amends. You can kind of just re- re- like, you know, remember to stay present longer every time you breathe out. 
And some people find that uh, sometimes if you get really calm in meditation, there can be a long gap uh, between the outbreath and the in-breath, or between the in-breath and the outbreath. And since there's a gap, uh, the mind's not connected. And so if the mind's not connected, an idle mind will get in trouble. And so, so it's important to re- kind, of, kind of, oh, there's a long gap, uh, remember to stay present. Or um, maybe it's a little bit complicated for this class, but, but one of the things that, um, uh, one of the instructions is if there's a long gap at the end of the outbreath, go feel something tangible in your body during the gap, like the hands touching or the knees touching the mat or something. Just something that's tactile, tangible, contact point. And this, so you're connected to something physical that's not your, you know, letting the mind think whatever it wants. And then when the in-breath begins, then you start again with the in-breath. Yes? So when we did the exercise in the class, and you said just be, like have your mind and body at the same place. Yes. So what I was doing, I said inhale, and I said this is the mind, and I was exhaling, and I could feel my, um, well, I took the breath out, and that was my body. So f- probably, I don't know, I had a couple of moments that I was like, oh, wow, okay, it feels really beautiful. But then, and, and I was like, okay, well, it's not working, but that's okay. I had a root canal then, it's like a lot of pressure and pain. I was like, oh, okay, pain and pain and pain. And I tried and didn't come back. So the question that I have, when you say it's kind of like not judging yourself, but then kind of becoming passive, so I was like, okay, I was not judging myself for not being with my mind and body, but uh-huh. you know, how do I know if it's I'm just getting passive and let my mind run and do its own thing? I'm not sure you pay attention. You look around, look at it. I'm not sure if there's a simple way. I mean, you know, it's a more complicated way than you're asking. How do you know when your mind is not so present? It's wandering away. Yeah, like how do you, I? Either you know or you don't know. If you don't know, you're not. There's no problem. <laughs> but 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 but, um, but maybe maybe this is a the better answer. I mean, I mean the answer is I'm trying to be serious. But but um, a lot of it comes with practice. The more you get, the more you practice, the more your awareness gets stronger and stronger, and you notice more stuff, and you're more present for things, and more peace of things. But one of the things uh, that's very very helpful with being more present uh, for your mind is to be more present for your body. The more you are embodied, the more you're in your body, the easier it is to, um, to work with your mind. And it's counterintuitive. Most people think they go directly to their mind. But the more you're at your body... And, and so, when I said you want the body to be in the same place, it's kind of like where your attention is. Your attention needs to be with your body, because that's the body. You, know, you bring your attention and the body together as opposed to letting your attention wander off into yesterday and tomorrow. So, um, I want to say a couple more words and then I can stay behind for other questions that people have. Um, um, just a couple of simple things. One is that, um, you know, to welcome you to IMC, those of you who are new here for the, this course, and to say that uh, we have no membership at IMC, no formal membership, but anybody who wants to be a member is a member. And uh, you're welcome to be part of this community in any, any kind of way you want. Um, by design, we made it the place kind of informal, so it's easy to come and go. Come if it works, go if it doesn't. And, um, and there's all kinds of different programs we have here throughout the, throughout the week and the year. And you're welcome to come to any of it that you like. And um, by now, hopefully you understand that everything we do here is offered freely, so that makes it really easy to come. And... Um, and if you like to be part of our community, you're, then you are. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, there's no other way than that. And please come. And, and there are so, a few things we do that are more social if you want to get to know people. Um, like Sundays, some, some so Sundays every month, there's a, one Sunday a month, there's a potluck, for example. People like to come to that. Or sometimes you come to the different programs. Sometimes it's hard to meet people because we're sitting silently, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, it's, it's a generally, gen, generally a very friendly community, so... If you, once you get over the fact that people are silent a lot, um, in the, they, um, I think people are pretty friendly and easy to connect, connect to here. 
and um, and then um, whenever we do this intro class, we always follow it with a variety of ways to be to support you in your practice as you go on. And so we have two things coming up that are kind of meant for you if you'd like it, but for anybody who wants to come. And that is this Saturday, Inez Friedman, who's one of our most senior students here, is a, uh, is going to teach a day-long class. It's a day-long retreat. Remember, I talked how important retreats are. That's um, that's kind of meant for you if you're interested in trying it out, uh, which is uh, from, I think, 9.30 to 3.30, or 9.30 to 4, I'm not sure. And um, it's meant as an introduction to the mindfulness meditation. So you'll get the, the, all, the, all, the, all this introduction again over one day uh, from a different person who's very wise. And, uh, and you'll get a little different, uh, and you get a chance to meditate and practice much more throughout the whole day. So it's a nice kind of taste of kind of doing it more completely and fully, and it's a review of all the instructions. The other thing we offer is starting next Wednesday for the next five weeks, five weeks. Um, Bud, who's up there, Bud Silver, and Susan Ezekiel are going to uh, lead a uh, what's called the Beginner's Practice Group. And um, anybody can, can come, but it's so kind of meant to follow up this and offer further support. And it's two very senior students who've been around practicing for many, many years who will um, uh, uh, do a little bit of teachings, uh, have some discussion with you, do some guided meditations some exercises. And um, it's done somewhat informally, so that's a lot of chance for give and take and questions, much more than this intro class here. And um, there's chance for meditation, probably a little bit more than we'd, we've been doing here. So it's a way of getting more support and more help as you, if you want to continue this. And um, uh, both Bud and Susan are people I have a lot of respect for and appreciation for their depth of their practice. And I'm very glad that they're going to be able to uh, share their experiences with you. So if you're interested, you can come again next week for that, for the following five weeks if you'd like. And then um, we do offer everything here freely. Um, we also are very grateful for the donations people give to make it possible for support me as a teacher and our center. Um, so we just to let you know, we're delighted and grateful that people support us. And if you choose to support us, we're delighted and grateful. Thank you. So um, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I have one more thing. And that is that we have many things through the week, but the Thursday sitting group, we have a sitting group on Thursday evening. Um, the sittings there are shorter than the Monday evening sitting group. They're half an hour long on Thursday. And, um, and the uh, focus a little bit more on Thursdays is more, um, more uh, um, the basics of meditation practice, more meditation practice. So it's a good place for beginners to go. Because if you come to Monday nights, for example, where I teach often, um, you're liable to get all kinds of abstract ideas and strange things. Like last, sun, last, mon- last Monday, I talked about God which has not very little to do with meditation. And so if you want to kind of get the basic stuff, you want to come. Um, Thursday's a good place also. So thank you again. <laughs>